Hello, I'm Tristan. I'm a UK government contractor. Um, I work closely with Dave and Greg, who, if the schedule is to believe, you've you've already met, but uh, that may have changed in the, in the time that I've been between me recording this and you seeing it. Um, I work mainly on software architectures and code generators, so I'm doing the bit that if I break it, everybody notices very quickly. Um, I'll be mostly following on from Colin's talk today and taking a closer look at bridges. In particular, I'll be looking at how they're useful in a, a distributed world. So a quick recap of, uh, of how we do, of what bridges are from, this is basically stolen from Colin's presentation earlier. Um, first of all, they're there to minimize domain coupling. So there's no pollution of subject matters. It reduces the impact of change and the required and provided capabilities don't need to match each other. So you can map, do some sort of mapping in the, in the bridge to change between um, different names, terminologies, units, invent new values, that sort of thing. So as I said, uh, you can map the terminology of one domain to the terminology of the other, um, and they shouldn't contain any logic that belongs in, in either domain. So a quick look at terminology that I'm gonna be using. Um, in bridge point, if you're used to that, then interface is um, uh, bi-directional. So you can have uh, signals or operations going to the provider or from the provider. Um, but for the purposes of um, today, I'm going to be only talking about unidirectional bridges. So when I say a provided interface, I mean a prov in bridge point terms, that would be a provided interface with only two provider operations and signals, um, or a required interface with only from provider operations or signals. Um, in Maslow terms, that would be a collection of domain services. Um, a provided service would be a domain service in Maslow, or one of those operations, or one of those operations on the uh, on the interface in Bridgepoint. Similarly, for required in an interface and service, um, which in Maslow a required interface would be a terminator, and a required service would be a terminator service. Um, when I talk about a bridge. In Mazel, that would be a project terminator, and a bridge service is a, term, a service on that terminator. In bridge point terminology, that would be a ball being attached to a socket. When I talk about a mapping, that's effectively, in, in Mazel terms, a domain service call inside a project terminator service um, with any associated conversion. So that's the thing that's actually doing the conversion from one domain's language to the other domain's language. Most of the time in today, I'm going to be um, concentrating on the mappings. I don't, it's not really relevant. Um, for the purposes of this, how they're grouped into bridges and um, interfaces. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to be talking about mappings. I may, however, slip up and call them interfaces or bridges or whatever, but I pretty much always mean a mapping. So a, a particular terminator service or bridge service um, could have multiple mappings inside it to call, uh, call out to multiple different domains. So let's look at a, a quick um, system, forgetting about distribution for a minute but just a, the logical view of a system um, without any bridges. So we'd, we'd have a requirer, and that required service has a, a, somebody else needs to provide the, that requirement and fulfill that requirement. And so I've colored that little blob in gray there to show that they've both got to be talking the same, same language. Domain reuse is um, limited to people, to domains that are talking the same language over their interface. So if we bring along another provider, that may, may be able to fulfill that requirement, it again needs to talk the same language. And if we have another requirer that requires that service, for that provider, the blue provider there, to be able to supply to it, it, it needs to be talking the same language and similarly when we've got everything together. If we then distribute that same, same idea, we've, we've got a requirer being deployed somewhere in the world and he sends out a message onto the, onto the messaging middleware um, because pretty much all um, service invocations in a de deployed in a distributed world will map to a, a message going out over some sort of middleware. Um, and so he sends out that message in the hope that somebody's going to um, receive it. There'll be a provider somewhere else on the network that will receive that message. Again, it's got to be the same, same message. Both of them have got to understand the same thing. Um, but you still can't use those domains in a different system unless they're still talking that same same interface language. So what we do is we add a bridge. So a quick example here, we've got an application that I'm going to call green, the green application because it's in a green box. And that's got um, 
needs to it requires somebody to understand when a user is logged on and it's got a couple of parameters on on its um, on its interface and there's a logging domain that um, wants to log user events with, for a particular user so something's happened to that user at the minute the those two don't match but they pretty much what do what doing the same thing so we have to write a mapping between them and that mapping will live in a bridge somewhere um, or bridge service somewhere so we write that mapping to convert and maybe the username goes straight across with no conversion and the timestamp gets dropped and we put a description in there that says logged on something like that but then brown application comes along and he's got a user active um, required service um, with a user parameter and a role parameter uh, that's just what he wants to tell the world and the logging domain might want to put the user in the username and the, the role in the description so we have to write a mapping but now along come the boys in blue uh, it's the security they want their audit system to be notified whenever a user logs on and they've got their own API to call um, and it looks a bit like this with a timestamp and a description um, so that's all they're auditing but they want to know about users logging on and, and things like that so again we have to write a, a mapping from each of the um, required domains that um, want to want to log want to audit their their users so we've got to write two extra mappings just to add this um, audit domain in so if we now distribute it I've got a number of different ways we can uh, deploy this. We can uh, we can deploy the mappings with the with the requirers, so here and over here, and so they'll just so that'll probably be in the same process or something like that, and deployed on that same box, and they will send out this the the message onto the network in the language of the the two providers. This is generally how um, our Mazel architecture works, in that we have the Terminator services get built into a process with the uh, with their requirer domain and they convert the message and the messages that go on the network are in the language of the um, domain services um, on, on the provider domains you could do it the other way and deploy the um, the mappings with the the providers in this case the message that goes out on the network would be the 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 requirers message so it's in green here and brown over here so again the the mappings would be deployed with the with the provider in the same process or on the same machine but there's a, a third way you could do it you could um, deploy the bridges entirely separately onto the onto the network and so that everything just each of the providers and requirers just sends its message out onto the network so the requirers send the message out onto the network uh, the mappings are on somewhere else on the network receive those messages convert them into the provider messages send them out again and then the, the provider the providers receive them um, this might be a useful pattern if you've got say a third party application that you want to put on the network that's already putting messages onto the network or taking messages off the network um, so you might want to deploy a bridge somewhere nearby it I would hope in the uh, in the network so there's not too much network traffic but you might just want to sit sit that um, so you don't have to tightly couple uh, the 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 mapping with the with the provider or similar the requirer so let's have a look at the uh, scalability of, of um, deploying with deploying with bridges so you need one mapping for each requirer provider pair so in general we've got r times p mappings for where well, r's the number of requirers and p is the number of providers um, for every concept you've got multiple messages transitioning the middleware so you can see here we've actually got four messages for ev for this users users logged on concept. We've got four messages going onto the onto the network, and even with the um, the other two, we've got two different messages going onto the network. So you might have um, quite a bit of um, network traffic that maybe you don't want. It does quickly become unmanageable if you're having multiple providers or multiple requirers. You can see you're going to have lots and lots, lots and lots of mappings to be done and lots of messages um, flying around some of the UK people might recognize this as the uh, Gravely Hill interchange um, it's near Birmingham uh, there's two motorways four main roads numerous minor roads three canals two rivers two railway lines 
all coming together at the same point and being intertwined with each other and bridging bridging between the between them i suspect the canals don't bridge to the motorways but you know what i mean uh, and this is uh, commonly known here as a spaghetti junction and we don't really want our systems to be turned into a spaghetti junction so what do we do about it um, well, the ideal solution would have completely loose coupling so all the domains are totally independent of each other we'd be able to reuse those same domains in lots of different systems um, we should be able to put a new new system onto the onto the network and be able to adapt it to all the others um, very easily uh, and that we should have a minimal number of mappings to write we don't want to be writing r times p mappings because uh, that's a big overhead and we also want to minimize the number of messages on the on the on the network so there's a well-known aphorism that um, all problems in computer sol science can be solved by another level of indirection except for the problem of too many layers of indirection right. a little addendum to that um, so we've got, already got one level of indirection with our with our bridge but uh, what are we going to do to solve and get this ideal solution well we have another level of indirection so this is what we had a minute ago now if we add in uh, another domain that's the let's call it the common domain for the time being and all that does is um, have a uh, provided interface that it takes takes a service and turns that into a required interface so it just basically a one-to-one -one mapping straight through this domain it doesn't do anything other than pass the requirement on but that now means that we can um, change the mapping so that the each mapping either converts to or from the, uh, the common domains um, interface so let's have a look at our example that we um, were looking at earlier again so we've got our green domain and we've got our logging domain and before we had a mapping sitting straight between the two of them um, which converted from one one language to the other so what we're going to do now is put in a another level of indirection and have a, a user's domain um, and this user's domain has a message called log on with a user and a timestamp and so this mapping green to users mapping just converts between username to user time to timestamp and off you go and then similarly on the other end um, it would have to do the user to the username this mapping here you do user to username and then put the timestamp in the description or invent some other description and throw the timestamp away so now when the brown domain comes along we just have to write one extra mapping to convert its services to the user domain service it's automatically um, just by writing that one mapping it's automatically um, been able to talk to the logging domain and when the um, boys in blue come along with the audit domain again it's just one extra mapping to write and that will automatically um, adapt both the green and the brown and any other um, require requiring domains that we that we might have in the system so if we then distribute that, these are our two main uh, ways of deploying a, a distributed system that we talked about earlier. We get to this. So the requirer lives with its mapping. Um, you deploy the mapping as part of the requirer and that does the conversion to the, the common message. And that message then goes on to um, each of the providers and their, their mappings um, do, do their job. So you can see it's a, it's a lot simpler way to, to deploy it and um, the, there's only one message traversing the middleware. So the other thing Colin talked about earlier was contracts. And let's have a quick recap of what he, what he said about contracts. Um, there's three main types of contract. There's the open contract where the sender doesn't require any response. There's a closed blocking contract where the sender does require response and sits there and waits for it. And this closed non-blocking contract where the sender does require response but it doesn't wait for it and that response will be provided asynchronously um, if we want to distribute contracts then um, we've got a slight issue that a distributed system is inherently asynchronous um, which means that blocking contracts don't work across a distributed boundary we can't send a blocking um, can't do a blocking function call across the network um, but that doesn't mean that we can't use blocking contracts um, we may be able to co-locate some components we may be able to adapt the contract using a co-located bridge 
Um, open contracts are just an easy easy mapping. You send a message. It's just a single message on on a, on the message uh, middleware. Uh, close non-blocking contracts again it's a fairly trivial mapping but uh, you need to introduce the concept of a response message and for that response message the requiring provider um, change places so an open to open contract is the trivial trivial mapping um, it just the bridge just doesn't need to do anything basically other than it's it's mapping of the the parameters so and i probably do mean a bridge here now rather than a mapping because when we come to the Closed contracts, you'll see they're, they're doing slightly more than just a just a mapping. This is um, a slightly wider, wider bit of functionality. So for open to open, it's trivial, trivial, and there's no restrictions on where you can deploy stuff. If you've got an open to closed contract, then um, the bridge handles the the mismatch in the contracts by throwing away the response, basically. Um, so the requirer doesn't need a response. The provider says, I'm going to provide you with a response, uh, send you a response, and the bridge has to say, well, okay, I'm just going to throw that away then because no one's interested. Um, if it's a blocking um, closed contract, then you have to deploy the, uh, the provider with the bridge so that the, uh, so that the, the blocking bit of the, of the call is all co-located. So if you're going from a closed contract to an open contract, then it's a bit more complicated because the requirer needs a response, but the provider's not providing one. So the bridge is going to have to invent some sort of response. Um, I suspect that's probably not going to be very useful in most circumstances unless it's a, just an OK or an ACK or something like that. Uh, and you're just going to have to assume that there's somebody on the other end who, who's going to get it. Um, again, for blocking the the blocking portion of it has to be co-located on the same same system because you can't block over the block over the network. If we're going close to closed, again, it's just a trivial mapping, um, but again, the blocking portion of it has to live in the same networks. So a, a close to closed contract where you've got a mismatch between the blocking um, status of it, um, you can still do it. Um, so, but the the bridge again is doing the doing the mapping. So here the requirer um, talks to the bridge. The bridge talks to the provider, waits for the response, and then asynchronously sends the response back to the requirer. Um, if you're going blocking to non-blocking, then this might be a, a problem. Uh, almost certainly will be a problem because the bridge sends that message asynchronously to the provider, which may take an awful long time to reply because it could be the over the other side of the world or it might just be doing a lot of processing or whatever. Um, Ten minutes later, it comes back with a response. Meanwhile, the re this requirement here has been blocking. So this is probably not something you want to be doing if you can possibly help it. So let's summarise the rules of um, bridge bridging contracts. Um, a closed blocking contract cannot be distributed. So this is what we saw earlier, that the, the blocking bit of it has to be uh, co-located. So as we co-located with, with its bridge. Um, if you're going open to close, then the bridge has to discard the response. And if you're going close to open, then the bridge has to invent a response. And if you're going blocking to non-blocking, then you might be waiting an awful long time. So probably not what you want to do. So there are some caveat, caveats um, with distributed contracts. On open contracts, there's no guarantee that anyone is at, at the other end is listening. So you could just be sending it off into the ether and Nobody's there, and you, you'll never know. There are closed contracts. You, there's no guarantee that anyone's listening. Therefore, there's no guarantee of getting a response back. Um, so that breaches the uh, contract definition that we had earlier for a closed closed contract, where, uh, where it requires a response. So we need to we need to do something about this. We can either relax the condition and just say, okay, we don't really mean a closed contract. Or maybe we should introduce a new contract type. Or maybe no response is counted as a valid response. I, I don't know the, the right way to um, to define this, but if you're talking about distributed systems, then the, the closed contract is not a, a good match for, for a distributed system um, as it stands exactly. So I, I'm thinking that we need this idea of an almost closed contract um, where the sender expects a response but doesn't require it. Uh, and then we need to, a way to define the required timeliness of that response. 
Um, so for say like a timeout or something like that, say, okay, if I don't get a response, what am I going to do? Um, should that be in the contract definition or is it an application decision? I don't know. Open for discussion. Um, the application has got to do, decide what it's going to do if it does time out on the basis that we have this semi-closed contract. And a bridge could adapt that to a fully closed contract by handling the timeout in the bridge rather than in the application. So if the application um, is a fully closed contract and it's bridging onto a, onto a network, then the bridge could do that ad adaptation by doing something with the timeouts. So the timeout doesn't necessarily have to be in the handled in the uh, in the domain. So we probably want to um, look at what goes on inside the uh, in, when we're dis doing a distributed application, what goes on inside that cloud of messaging middleware? There's lots of concepts in there that don't really map to um, domain concepts, but we still need to be able to define them. And so what we've started to use is Async API, which is, uh, um, provides a rigorous definition of how an application communicates over messaging middleware. So it will define the message format, schemas, payloads, headers, it defines addresses for uh, this is my address send it send this to me i'm sending this message to this address that sort of thing um, it talks about connection protocols um, doesn't have any support for contracts at the moment although there is some talk of them adding um, replies and things like that in there at some point in the future um, and it's a json yaml spec which means it's parsable by a code generator which is very handy so, how does an async API how does an async API define um, define a message? Well, let's go back to our users log user log on message that we had earlier. Um, it would probably look something like this in um, async API. And so, each required or provided service maps to a message. Um, so you see here we've got the users log on message with a bit of a description there. Um, and the service parameters map to message properties or headers or other things as we might we'll see a bit later. Async API also has the idea, um, the concept of channels which define which messages the application will publish and subscribe to. And so a channel definition looks a bit like this, where you've got a channel name and this is this here is the uh, this here is the address. And both the publisher and subscriber refer to the same message definition. You can use um, JSON references to, to do that, JSON schema references. So you could have your message defined in a common, um, common file somewhere that both of them refer back to, just like a hyperlink type thing. Um, the required services um, says, I'm going to publish, and the provided service subscribes. Um, and you'd have um, an async API definition for each application that's sitting on the network. Um, and again, they can use, so they can all reference these common definitions of message formats and things but each each application has its own definition so we can then use that to um, auto generate bridges from the domain domain as long as we've got some sort of um, way to map between the note how we want to map between them so when you've got a, a domain coming up on the, on the network you need it needs to be able to say which messages it's interested by means of a subscription uh, this is for a provider and so we could do that at startup. So the bridge could just say, okay, I'm going to subscribe to the user list message and it talks to the middleware to, subs to that subscription. And then the, the bridge on the, on the other side could subscribe to the query users message. And then the admin domain comes up and says, I've got my GUIs up displaying a list of all the users. So I need to know all those users. So it sends out a displaying users message. The bridge turns out into query users. This bridge here then turns that into uh, the query user's message for the for the user's domain, who then sends back its user list, which he, which this side is subscribed to. So that this is doing subscriptions at startup. Um, the bridge just handles it all, but we need to be able to define that in the bridge definition. Other way you might want to do it is a dynamic subscription. So you don't know at startup that you want to be um, subscribed to a particular message, but you. Um, you need to subscribe um, later on. So the admin domain might say, okay, I'm displaying user Fred. The bridge says, okay, I'll subscribe for that message then. And then when the user's domain gets an update and updates 
user thread it sends that out on the, on the network and because the, this bridge is now subscribed he'll receive that message and pass it on to, to his domain so you can see here that this required service on the admin domain doesn't translate to a provided service on any other domain it just tr translates into a subscription message to the middleware so the bridge can handle that the middleware is effectively providing a subscribe provided service um, so you, you're bridging to the middleware domain for this particular message and you can also parameterize subscriptions so um, you can parameterize the channel name um, or you can put a filter on it on a message on a subscription so you can put a filter on a subscription so for that we need to have some way to provide the um, parameters to the um, subscribe um, and the required service could take parameters which is what we've just done a second ago with the uh, with the user displaying user one we passed a parameter thread and that became part of the, the channel parameter thread there well, the other thing we could do is have a provided service that provides um, the values to the bridge so the bridge is in charge of that and so the bridge says okay I need an application ID say for instance and the admin domain provides that admin that application ID back and then the bridge says okay I need to subscribe for all the messages headed to the admin one domain so how do we define our bridges um, the, and the mappings that are inside them um, many bridges and mappings will be trivial and the names will just match matching contracts as well um, and then in that case the intermediate domain that we're introducing in the, in the middle of this in, extra level of indirection might just adopt one the interface of, of one end and say okay this is the this is my interface and it's the same as this end so we don't need to do anything in terms of the mapping so we need an easy way to do trivial mappings um, we need to be able to um, provide default values and optional values so that the bridge can invent new new things or throw things away we need to be able to do conversions from one type to another and we might need more complex transformations it might be worth using action language for some but I would hope that for most bridges we wouldn't need to use action language and we should have an easy we need an easy way to define the bridge without using action language if we can if we can help it when we're talking about um, distributed bridges then there's a few extra things we need to be concerned about um, we need to be concerned about subscriptions and subscription parameters and timeouts so we need some way of defining those in the in the bridge mapping so in summary um, bridges are especially useful in distributed systems uh, because they allow full decoupling of domains adding in an extra bridge or an intermediate domain so we've got bridges on both ends allows even more flexibility in decoupling and bridges allow mapping between different parameters in different types or different unit conversions that sort of thing and also allow mappings between contracts um, the formalism at the minute doesn't really support them the the official formalism and I, we think it should I think I stole that point from Colin who obviously agrees with me and uh, doing an OA of bridges would help with a, a common understanding and so we're at the point now where we're trying to def define decide how we define our bridge mappings and having a, a formalism and an OA of, of bridges would really help with with trying to um, trying to lock that down so that's the end uh, end of it from me um, hopefully you've got a, a chance now to ask the uh, the future me some some questions